Well, good morning. Psalm 31 speaks of God being our place of refuge. And toward the end of the psalm, verse 21 says this, Praise be to the Lord, for he showed me the wonders of his love when I was in a city under siege. Sounds like us today, in a city under siege, in total lockdown. Praise be to the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his love. In the Lord I have and I take refuge. So welcome to Church Online. Let's take refuge in the Lord this morning. For those of you who may not have caught up with us last week, did share this and uh, you might be wondering, we are indeed in a very stable financial position and so we just wanted to thank you for your faithful giving. Again, encourage you to begin meeting together, perhaps in ones or twos up to ten, but uh, keep remembering your social distancing. We have no intention to get our larger groups back together in the life of the church until there's an easing of the one, one and a half metre rule. It would just be too difficult before that occurs. Now, if you have your Bible with you this morning, I encourage you to open up to the book of Ephesians. We're going to spend a little time in uh, the book of Ephesians this morning. And Paul, as he writes to the church in Ephesus, he writes some 10 years after he had been visiting there at the church. He had visited a number of times. He'd been through Ephesus. He'd made uh, Ephesus sort of his home base during his third missionary journey. And so he knew the church well, but it's 10 years later that he writes to the church. And he writes whilst he's now in under home arrest in Rome. Paul is in total lockdown. In his opening greeting in verse 1, he says that he's an apostle of, the G- of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Not only was Paul sent by the will of God, but as he writes this letter... By the will of God, he now finds himself under home arrest. By the will of God, he is now a man who has lost his freedom. He's in total lockdown. He was a man who had suffered persecution. He'd suffered beatings. He'd been stoned. He'd been left for dead. He'd been in shipwrecks. He had suffered personal attacks. So much more by the will of God. What an amazing testimony that is for us. God is sovereign, and while we don't always understand what God is up to, while we don't always understand why we go things through the things that we go through, we can look at the example of Paul and our hearts can be encouraged. It's all by the will of God. God is in control. What we're facing today, what you are facing, is by the will of God. And some people struggle with this, the fact that hard times come for Christians who are seeking to live out their lives in in full obedience to God. Yet, wasn't that Paul's position? Sherry Cowell, she wrote this. We all have those days when we feel like the stuffing has been beaten out of us. Without even realising it, we've entered into a boxing ring and we've been punched, we've been beaten. Wounds have opened up. How can so many things be going sideways all at once when we've been diligently trying to obey God and follow his commands? Wasn't that Paul's position? Diligently obeying God, following his lead, following the Holy Spirit's prompting, and yet everything seemed to be going sideways. She then says this, Rather than trying to formulate an answer, 
we do well to remember that he who committed no sin had it even worse. He was betrayed, flogged, mocked, crucified. When we're feeling bruised and beaten, we need to remind ourselves that the Lord has been in the boxing ring. And we don't fight on our own. He knows the blows that we've taken, some because of our own disobedience, but some because of our obedience to the Lord. Well, he has taken his own blows and his hands and his side attest to that fact. Yet even now, he who defeated sin, he who defeated sin and death is lifted high above the nations. By the will of God, we're going through what we're going through. By the will of God, Jesus went through what he went through for our salvation. Praise God. Isaiah 53.10 says that it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. But that verse goes on to say that the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. And so we know victory in spite of the circumstances that we might face. We know victory and we can take heart this morning. And I want to encourage you now just to take the bread that you might have you might have already prepared. Take that bread and we're going to remember Jesus' sacrifice. For by the will of God, we are saved. Praise God. Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you this morning as we've been reminded it was by your will, Father, your will to crush Jesus, to cause him to suffer. But of course, your plan was that through his crushing, through his suffering, we would know salvation and we know hope and joy and love and forgiveness. And so we praise you this morning as we take of this bread. We give you thanks as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together. as you take the cup. The verse from Isaiah again reminds us that it was the Lord's will to crush him. Of course, the grape needs to be crushed for the juice to come forth. And we drink this this morning. Jesus used grape juice for us to remember Jesus We remember he was crushed. But praise God. Praise God for the salvation that we know as a result. The Lord indeed has prospered his will. His will has prospered for us. Let's drink in remembrance of him. Can we again join in prayer? Father, as we continue to look into your word, may you be prompting us and empowering us by your Holy Spirit 
not only to understand what you're saying to us through your word, but that our lives might be impacted in such a way that you are glorified as we, as we honour you with our lives. And so we commit the rest of this time to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the church in Ephesus was made up of Jews and Gentiles and understandably they, they struggled to get along. You see, racism was rife within the wider community and racism didn't go away within the life of the church. Once a person became a, a Christian, it wasn't as though racism just had, uh, diminished. Jews still struggled to love Gentiles and Gentiles still thought of the Jews as dogs. And so the church now faced challenging times. It was a challenge to now see how this new community would function. People who, who once held such discrimination and even hatred toward one another should now deal with one another in love. And the challenge to leave behind Judaism for the, for the Hebrew people, for the Jews, with all of its elitism, to leave that behind for a new community of unconditional love and acceptance. It's always a challenge to accept others who we've previously had difficulty with, to accept them as brothers and sisters. And it's always a challenge to leave the old ways that we've always done things and adopt change. And of course with COVID-19 we don't know how things might need to change for us. In chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says that the dividing wall of hostility had now been destroyed. And from the beginning of chapter 3, Paul speaks of a mystery, a mystery that God had now brought to light. And this mystery, what God had done, challenged the Jews' position in particular. This great mystery was that God's love was now clearly demonstrated for all people. No longer was God's love available for just the Jews. In verse 6, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of now one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. How this must have challenged the Jewish held position. We're God's people. We are the chosen nation. What a challenge. A paradigm shift was required for them. The scales would need to be peeled away or drop off from their, their eyes. And so following on from the Lord's Prayer that we looked at last week in Luke chapter 11, where Jesus promised the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit would be given to anyone who asked for it. Remember, Jesus says, Ask and you will receive. Anyone who asks receives the Holy Spirit. I thought it would be good to have a look this morning at Paul's powerful prayer and that prayer for the church at Ephesus here in chapter 3, verses 16 through to 21 in particular. And you might recall that we looked at the book of Ephesus a couple of years ago and we noted that this letter is really in two parts, the first three chapters, the last three chapters. The first three chapters are academic or theological in nature, whilst the second half is very practical. And interestingly, there's a connection, a connecting point, a connection between the two, and it's these verses that we're looking at today. It's this section on prayer. Prayer is the key. Prayer is the bridge that links the doctrinal section of the book, chapters 1 to 3, into this practical section, verses, uh, chapters 4 to 6. 
Prayer is that which turns our beliefs into behaviour. Prayer is that which turns doctrine into doing. Prayer is that which turns the principle of unity that prayer that Paul is talking about in the first three chapters and that he's calling the people to the practice of unity in the last three chapters. Is it any coincidence that Jesus too prays for unity as recorded in John 17 before going to the cross? Jesus has taught his disciples and he's shown them the way and now he prays that they and us may live out not just what's in our heads but live it out in our behaviour, that our behaviour will change, that we will live in love. Prayer is the, the bridge between knowing something in our head and adopting it in our very being. Why? Because in prayer we invite the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work within us. We're asking God to reveal himself to us, but then to transform us. We do that in prayer. And this is at the forefront of Paul's prayer as he prays for the church in Ephesus. From verse 16, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit, through his Spirit in your inner being, so that you might, Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. Again, last week in Luke chapter 11, Jesus calls us to pray to pray asking for the Holy Spirit and here too Paul is asking on behalf of the church in Ephesus for the Holy Spirit. Now I wonder have you ever said to someone, make yourself at home. Make yourself at home. I wonder if you really meant that. If you really meant that, then that person could rearrange all the furniture repaint the walls, eat all your food. When someone truly makes themselves at home, they live in that home as though it is their own place. Well, that's what we want Jesus to do in our hearts. In this verse, that Christ might dwell in your hearts. We want Christ to dwell in our hearts, to make himself at home, to rearrange the furniture as it were, paint the walls, whatever colour he wants, to make all the changes that he desires for us. How does that happen? Well, it happens by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. As believers, we know that he already lives in our hearts, but by inviting him to go on filling us, we want him to make himself at home in our hearts. We want him to live there like he owns the place. We want him to take possession of our, our hearts and become the controlling influence of all of our attitudes and our actions. As I mentioned last week, it is the Holy Spirit who comforts and encourages, but he also guides and prompts and directs. It's the Holy Spirit who strengthens and sustains so that we may cope with our daily circumstances. But it's the Holy Spirit within us that produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God's fruit, godly fruit of peace and joy, patience, love, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit who helps us as we interact with family or work colleagues in a godly manner, as we face varying situations that might cause heightened levels of stress. We face situations that we really don't want to face, but to face them in a godly way, it's through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that brings unity, allows us to truly love one another. One another. 
We're empowered, we're transformed by the Holy Spirit. And so Paul asked for the power of the Holy Spirit to come and allow the church in Ephesus to learn to love one another. Again, folk who had a hatred toward one another. Well, then Paul says, And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Wow, what words. What a concept. What are, we, what are we trying to grasp here? Well, remembering that Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, remembering the Jewish position and the, the Jewish rabbis, they had set themselves up as being the ones with all of the knowledge about God and how to please God. And remembering too that Paul, having learnt through his own experience as a zealous Pharisee, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he describes the love of God as a love that surpasses knowledge. In other words, I think this is what Paul is saying. I thought I knew what God was up to. As a Pharisee of the Pharisees, I thought I knew what God was up to, but his is a love that is multidimensional in breadth, in length, Depth and height, a love that reaches to the extremities of the earth, embracing every man, every woman, every child. It includes every colour and race. Without favouritism, we are all one in Christ. For Paul, he now understands that the love of God surpassed anything that he thought that he knew about God. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. I think that for us, as Paul described it, God's love is indeed immeasurable. Because the more that we understand it, the more we realise we're just beginning to grasp his love what it is, what it means. The more that we understand God's love, the more that we then grow in grace and mature in our faith and we're strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit in our inner man, our inner being. And so what, what is the measure of God's love for us, this full measure? What is the, the measure of God's love? It is the gift of his Son, Jesus Christ. And what's the measure of Jesus' love for us? The measure of his love is in his death on the cross. And so if we're to know the the measure of the fullness of God's love for us, then we will acknowledge that we are saved by Jesus' death on the cross. But this is just the starting point. And again, the Jews and the Gentiles were just starting to come to terms with this new paradigm, a new way of thinking, a new way of understanding what God is up to. It was in the book of Isaiah that God wrote, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. They're just starting to grasp and get an understanding of what God's really up to. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians 1, he wrote, The world, through its wisdom, did not know God. But the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. You see, in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon selected individuals as God so directed. But now, now, in the New Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit is available to anyone just for the asking. How things have changed. 
What a radical shift away from the days of old. A new way of understanding, understanding God was required. How blessed are we? How blessed are we to live in these times? How wonderful is is God our Father to make himself available to us in this way? Thus, Paul prays for the church in Ephesus, for the Jews and the Gentiles, that they may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with love. And to pray that prayer for ourselves We're asking that through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us, we might know an ever-deepening understanding of Jesus' love, an understanding that continues to grow deeper and deeper, that's not just a head knowledge, but heart-impacting and behaviour-changing, resulting in an ever-growing maturity, filled to the measure of the fullness of God that enables us to live and love like God. Without him, we're selfish, we're self-centred. We only love because he loved us first. We can only live and love others as he does, as he lives within us by his Holy Spirit. Thus Paul prays that the Jews and the Gentiles in the church at Ephesus be filled to the measure of the fullness of God, for God is love. God is love. In his book, When God Doesn't Make Sense, and I guess we've all been there at times, God doesn't seem to make sense. Well, in his book, this book, James Dobson includes a letter that he had received and it's a letter that's written from a father who's describing the love that he has for one of his daughters. And in it we see a glimpse of the the love that God has for us but we also gain a glimpse of the kind of love that we can have for one another. Of course, through the power of the Holy Spirit. His daughter's name was Bristol. And this father, he wrote, he wrote this. Before you were born, I prayed for you. In my heart, I knew that you would be a little angel, as so you were. When you were born on my birthday, April 7, it was evident that you were a special gift from the Lord. But how profound a gift you turned out to be. How profound a gift you turned out to be. More than the gurgles and the rosy cheeks, more than the firstborn of my flesh, a joy unspeakable. You showed me God's love more than anything else in all of creation. Bristol, you taught me how to love. I certainly loved you when you were cuddly and cute when you jabbered your first words. I loved you when the searing pain of realisation took hold that something was wrong, that maybe you weren't developing as quickly as your peers and even when we understood it was more serious than that. I loved you when we went from hospital to clinic to doctor looking for a medical diagnosis that would bring us some hope. And of course, we, we always prayed for you. We prayed and we prayed. I loved you when you moaned and cried. Your mum and I and your sisters would drive for hours late at night to help you to fall asleep. I loved you when you were confused, when with tears in your eyes you would bite your fingers or your lip by accident. I loved you when your eyes crossed 
And then when you finally went blind. I most certainly loved you when you could no longer speak. But how profoundly I missed your voice. I loved you when scoliosis began to wrench your body like a pretzel. And when we put a tube into your stomach so that you could eat. We fed you one spoonful at a time, even up to two hours per meal. I managed to love you when your contorted limbs began to make changing 10 years of nappies even more difficult. Bristol, I even loved you when you could not say the one thing in life that I longed to hear. Daddy, I love you. Bristol, I loved you when I was close to God and even when he seemed far away. When I was full of faith and when I was angry with him. And the reason I loved you, my Bristol, in spite of these difficulties, is that God put this love in my heart. This is the wondrous nature of God's love. He loves us when we're blind or deaf or twisted in body or in spirit. God loves us even when we can't tell him that we love him back. And this letter went on. But that's the way God loves us. He certainly loves us when we're cuddly and cute But he also loves us when we're blind and deaf and twisted in body or in soul. He loves us even when we can't tell him that we love him back. He still loves us. And Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus, for it's as we come to appreciate God's love for us more and more, it's then that we're more able to love one another. Love others with that same kind of love. Paul said, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. I trust that we're asking God to do his work within us, that we are cooperating with him, that we love one another, that we're prepared to love those that we find difficult to love. I trust that we too are praying for one another for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Let's join together in a song as we commit to bowing before our wonderful God in prayer and allowing him to reign over our lives. Let's sing.
Hide me in your love. Bring me to my knees. May I know Jesus more and more. Come live in me all my life. Take over. Come breathe in me. And I will rise on eagles' wings. Come live in me all my life. Take over. Come breathe in me. And I will rise on eagles' wings. Let's then close our time together in prayer. And we're going to use the beautiful words of Paul that directly follow on from our reading this morning, verses 20 to 21. Let's pray together. And so now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. May we live to glorify our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. May we go in his peace. Amen. God bless you all.